and Charles, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, hopefully you can all see the presentation. Uh, yes, no, yes, there it is. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody, for organising this. Really great to see so many people. I've just counted 100 people on that, which is uh, really good attendance for UK Shelter Forum and uh, presumably easier to get here. Uh, so uh, we yesterday um, had planned and, uh, and did uh, 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 present um, a shelter and health learning day. It was, it was, we normally have a, additional activities as part of the UK Shelter Forum the day before with invited people. And this was planned before the COVID outbreak. Um, we decided to go on with it um, on Zoom and it was really successful. We had over a hundred people who attended uh, at least for part of the day. And uh, I think some 80, 90 people stayed for the whole of the day. It was quite a long day but it was really great. It's an initiative to convene around wider impacts of shelter, um, specifically health and shelter. It's funded from the Global Challenges Research Funding, which is part of UK government research. Um, the, the, the groups that were re represented were WASH practitioners, shelter practitioners, health practitioners, uh, the shelter cluster leads were there, uh, development housing um, researchers were there, urban planners, environmental health consultants, academics from epidemiology and uh, humanitarian and development donors. Next slide, please. You can see what we talked about. We talked about uh, physical health. We talked about measurement and evidence. We talked about mental health and we talked about game changing crises, including the implications of COVID and the climate emergency. Next slide, please. And so cutting to what we found, we will be producing a report. Some of you on this call were present on the day and thank you very much for your attendance. We will be producing a report and we will be flagging that on UK Shelter Forum. And if you're interested, uh, message me specifically and I will make sure that you're on the distribution list. So what did we, what did we find out? We, we, co we coalesced around the idea of environmental health and post-crisis homes and communities. Um, it's, we want to call it homes because we find that shelter doesn't get much traction in wider humanitarian discourse. Shelter is thought to be tents and tarpaulins. When we start to talk about homes and communities, we get better traction with development actors and, and other sectors. So we want to keep that focus. We talked all, we coalesced around healthy habitats as well, whatever that is, and we'll, we'll start to flesh that out. Um, uh, there, there was a discussion around, there's a, there was room for a community of practice across sectors, across primarily WASH, shelter and health, but other, other sectors also, and discussion around what that might look like, look like in ter, in, inside the humanitarian architecture. Uh, we were, so the main findings were that there was a call for practical advice for humanitarian responders. So what does, there might be lots of research around, there might be lots of research, there is lots of research around health and housing and development settle, settings, um, uh, long-term impacts of unhealthy environments in, in uh, informal communities, for example, what does that look like in humanitarian response? Um, there was a, a, a call for education, um, language, to make a common language, to provide better evidence, and at the value of cross-disciplinary collaboration. And then a lot of discussion about mental health, about, about something about, well, is, is rebuilding a therapeutic process in itself? And can we build on that in terms of investigating mental health and shelter and the links? Um, please look at, there's a, there's a link at the bottom of the slide on your screen, selfrecovery.org is our overall website for this project. The website, the project is about self-recovery and one of the wider implications of self-recovery is about health and the linkages between it, which is why it falls under that. But do have a look on the website if you want more. I'm on 4 minutes 33 and that's it from me. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect timing. That's how we need this to go. <laughs> so um, with no further ado, over to Fiona Kelling with uh, the Wider Impacts of Humanitarian Shelter and Settlements Assistance Report. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick announcement um, about the availability of this report that was released in February. 
it's part of a consultancy that I did at the end of last year for interaction um, that can be found via this link. Um, I think it's common sense that there are links between shelter and other sectors, but these haven't been well studied or articulated. And so Interaction commissioned this piece of research. Can you move to the next slide? Sorry. Um, in order to provide an initial review of evidence on the impacts of, of providing shelter and settlements assistance with the aims of increasing awareness and improving intersectoral understanding and encouraging collaboration. So I actually read over 280 documents, but about 190 of them contributed towards this report um, with a range of examples of the direct, indirect and cumulative impacts of shelter and settlements assistance on a variety of different sectors, including health, livelihoods, ERR, social cohesion, education, food, gender, um, and also pulled out some um, additional themes that were important, including participation and um, the effects of integrated assistance. Um, overall, though, a key finding of the research was the need to improve systems to be able to monitor impact, because many of the studies were not necessarily uh, the most reliable, and we need to improve the methodologies that we're using in order to um, have more robust evidence. So it includes some recommendations for donors, um, for academics, and for humanitarian organisations in order to, strength to strengthen the future evidence base. Next slide. It also um, included infographics that are part of an advocacy toolkit. Um, so there are posters and social media cards available um, on a selection of the different impacts um, that were found with references. And uh, next slide. You can download all of these from the Interaction website. Um, you'll find the full report. You'll also find an additional report with um, more detailed findings. The full report is only about 20 pages. The detailed findings also list um, all 190, however many, um, different sources that are referenced. Um, and uh, then Annex B, the methodology, which I'm highlighting because it's really important that you are, can also be confident in the methods that were used to create this report, um, as well as the advocacy toolkit. And if you have any other questions, um, you can contact um, Hilmi at uh, Interaction um, or myself using my email address. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll go straight on to, uh, and remember, if you do have questions, post them in the chat um, in case you missed the introduction and the speakers will have a look in the chat box after their talk and try and answer them. Uh, so over to Hilmi. Hi guys. Thank you. Uh, thanks Fiona for that. And uh, it's a, it was a really uh, uh, excellent work. Now, uh, also, uh, those infographics are available if you want to use, customize, uh, please let me know. Um, through this and previous work, uh, we have learned a lot, uh, but we also learned we don't know a lot. Um, so our next piece of work uh, is uh, to create an agenda for uh, a roadmap for research. Um, you know, in our sector, it's been a tendency to do an m and &E program, for, get some findings and, you know, perpetuate that until it becomes a fact. We do not do a systematic uh, research uh, like other sectors, public health, uh, epidemiology or other, other sectors, how they learn across context. Uh, for example, you know, you do a 500 uh, household uh, M&E doesn't mean it applies to uh, other contexts in, you know, across uh, the world or other con different types of uh, uh, disasters. So we need to be very careful about what we know and uh, what evidence we have. Um, and we also need to realize that our collective humanitarian influence is limited, so we need to learn from others. Uh, over time, um, you know, uh, what we do, you know, how, how we can make a bigger impact, you know, do we want to make 500 houses, 5,000 houses a better uh, place to live, which is very, very important, and we need to do that. But uh, we also need to think how we can uh, change the game, like how we can influence policies. By also changing policies, you affect over time uh, millions of others. So these are some of these concerns and we want to learn. Thank you. Um, 
uh, built upon past initiatives, uh, such as uh, Aaron, uh, Amy from University of Colorado, University of Sydney has done prioritization of research. Um, we want to kind of also agree across the sector how and what are important to find, what could make more uh, impact. Uh, and through this, we also want to create a, a better sustained partnership between, uh, between academia and, and uh, practitioners. And hopefully we can uh, go and change practices, policies and impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we are calling for chapter authors and uh, lead editors through uh, EOI. I will shortly uh, post the link. Um, please submit uh, something that you are passionate about, something you find as a gap. Thank you. More questions, uh, you can reach out to me. Thank you very much, Hilmi. And uh, we are straight on to Jennifer George and Mark Brees from Cambridge University. Hello. Uh, I'm very honored today to introduce to you uh, the Sustainable Shelter Group, which is a new research group myself. Uh, I'm, an, I'm based in the Department of Architecture and Jennifer George, who's based in the Department of Engineering, are starting based out of the University of Cambridge. And we're looking to create active pr practitioner partnerships with other academics and very importantly, humanitarians with field experience, humanitarian agencies um, and other professional expertise to really try and sort of bring together that wealth of experience, knowledge and different methodologies to create better integrated, sustainable in every sense, relevant sheltering solutions. So it's, it's very open. We've just starting, we're looking to build partnerships, go in for collective uh, grant bids, but also we're available to draw on the resources of Cambridge and other departments, as well as our own, uh, to, 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 to give you research resources and to enable you to commission specific uh, parts of research, but also create larger projects. We're very flexible. We can work in different ways, complementing your, your, your existing projects, doing targeted specific research, or going in on wider bids with you for broader, longer term uh, projects. Um, we also uh, churning out a series of events. The idea is to have a series of thoughtful discussions and talks as well as accessible outputs. So not, you know, academic uh, publications which are behind uh, paywalls you can't read, but things which are very much digestible by the public sphere, but are still rigorous and useful and effective and meaningful for the shelters and settlement sector. Um, uh, we, uh, well, I'll talk about a couple of the outputs. We just go to the next slide. Um, Two outputs which are actually hot off the press next week is coming out Structures of Protection, which is an edited collection I co-edited with my colleague, Professor Tom Scott Smith, who's based at the Refugee Study Center in Oxford. Um, and uh, we'll be putting the links to these in the chat as well as, in fact, you can pre-order it on Amazon. And if you email me, I'll give you a discount code as well. Uh, and that's looking really at a broad range of um, shelter responses across uh, Europe and the Middle East and also other, uh, particularly in the last sort of 10, 15 years in response to recent crises, really kind of thinking more broadly about the issues of shelter, how we're providing shelter, the systems and the, and, and the histories and theories and the practicalities of that. Uh, we have a fantastic range of 20 contributors from a whole series of backgrounds, practitioner, academics, institutions worldwide. Um, and also there's a documentary feature film that I've produced with my colleague, uh, Professor Tom Scott Smith as well, which if you go to shelterwithoutshelter.com, you can sign up for updates. It's already and done. We're hoping to release it later this year. And that's looking at shelter responses across Europe and the Middle East um, to the Syrian um, uh, civil war sort of post 2012, 2015. Um, and I'll hand over now to my colleague, Jenny George, who's just going to talk through some of our other work. Great, thanks, Mark. So um, just briefly talking about upcoming uh, events that are happening. So we're putting together a graduate lecture course. Um, this is a module hopefully being developed with the architecture and engineering departments. So we're looking for any input from people here, practitioners, academics, um, if you have anything that you'd like to contribute to that, please do get in touch. On the 27th of May, so not too long away, we have a panel discussion which is being hosted by 
the Centre for Geopolitics. Uh, please do join for that, it's at 6 p.m. in the evening and I put the link in the, in the chat. And then another initiative is this um, idea of conversations. So these are also through the Centre for Geopolitics, um, but we basically post a 300 word um, concept and then invite responses from everybody in the field, practitioners, academics, to also provide 300 word response. And it's a great platform for conversation. Um, we've had recent speakers at the Centre for Geopolitics have been people like Rory Stewart and the MP Andrew Mitchell, Bridget Kendall, Sir John Sawyer. So there's a real global audience for these conversations. So we do invite you to get involved. And I believe that's the end of our five minutes. So I will I'll let you carry on there. Thank you very much. Perfect timing. Um, a very interesting looking group. Thank you. And uh, the next is, uh, we have Boshra Koshnevis from IOM talking about IEC materials. Uh, hi everyone. Um, I want to talk about IEC, information, education, communication material. And I want to start with the sentence that it, information is an aid. Um, during, uh, during emergency responses, we often see that there is not enough time to develop IEC material. And also in the more stable uh, situations, uh, reviewing of existing IEC material is always a helpful starting point. And this is exactly what is suggested by the, um, the protocol made by the Promoting uh, Safer Building Working Group. Uh, if you can go on the next slide, please. Um, as the first step, uh, it's suggested to understand the context and uh, one of the stages is uh, reviewing the existing IEC initiatives and it's mentioned that it's critical to identify them and learn from them. Um, so what we're doing with this project? Um, this project aims to promote relevant IEC materials to decision makers that can be used um, to communicate with the affected populations uh, during the shelter and settlement responses, especially during uh, the emergency. And, and we want to improve the capacity to rapidly provide messages um, to affected populations ranging from how to access assistance to how to build shelter and how to use the material. Um, so just to uh, mention again, we don't want to just create a library, uh, but um, since we need to learn from uh, the material, there would be additional stage to it, which is the review of existing IC material. And it would be done for key existing IC materials to understand if there's a um, strength or weaknesses on them, uh, what are the learnings from the rollout of the project uh, or how uh, they should be adopted for the next use. Uh, next slide, please. So we started with collecting uh, the files um, as the first step. Um, we asked some people to share their hard drive with us and we, look, we collected the files from the archives. Um, we ended up with 30,000 files and we soon realized that we need a clear scope uh, for this project. And we added the verification um, stage actually um, to the process. So for us, um, the IEC should be about crisis response and on shelter and settlement responses and also cross-cutting issues. Um, it should talk um, with our primary audience, which is affected population, but uh, if it talks to secondary and tertiary audience, which are field staff and contractors and technical shelter staff, it should have the possibility to be adapted and modified. Um, um, then after this stage, right now we are ended up with 1,000, almost 1,000 1, files and we, uh, we are doing uh, in intelligent crowdsourcing with some universities, uh, send up a new IC right now. Um, so far we have 500 um, files in our database. But after this, we, uh, we still do um, uh, an analysis to make sure first there's no duplication and that uh, we are not missing information, um, important information. So there is still chance to add the missing data in the database. And in the next stage, uh, which is review, um, we want to have uh, key materials reviewed uh, by three groups. Well, non-experts, uh, which we may be able to have it for more uh, num for a long, larger number of material, but country level and expert review are the key for us. And by country level review, uh, we would be able to know also if there's any important uh, material produced in that country um, that is missing from our database that we can still add it. And um, here we also here we would be able to also understand what is the quality of the material 
material and if um, there's a risk that um, actually there's a, the message in the IC would be misunderstood by affected population or should be changed. Um, and after that, which is the usage stage, we, uh, we would have at the end uh, an interface which should be accessible through the Global Shelter Cluster. Um, and once the, uh, once the website is ready, we would have the same process um, sort of online. So here is, uh, af here we would be able to ask people online to go and check and see if there is a missing material uh, in the database and we can um, continue running. Um, next slide. So here is a taxonomy for us. I know no one can see it. Um, so we divided information to file, data, content, and context. Um, next one. And we can uh, count how many material for now we have in our database in under, of each, um, under each topic and each headings. Uh, for example, right now I can say that uh, we didn't receive uh, a lot of material on, for example, HLP or access to assistance, and we're trying to add those material in the database. So um, thanks to everyone who already expressed interest to help us uh, for the review and also to send the, those who send us the files. And if anyone else is interested to help, please um, send us an email. Thank you. Right, thank you very much. Um, and then, oh, sorry, there is a echo here. Um, straight on to Laura Haycoop from IOM talk about the shelter project book. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, so I'm just going to give a very quick update on, on shelter projects. Um, shelter project is a, a global shelter cluster initiative to, um, to collate and to share um, case studies of humanitarian shelter and settlement responses. Um, next slide please. I know a number of you are are very familiar with shelter projects from over the years, um, but I'll just give a little bit of background for context. Um, so shelter project, as I mentioned, is a compilation of case studies. It's now in its seventh edition, so you can see down the side there the previous editions of uh, all, all of the previous editions um, that have been published. And we're currently now starting to work on, on the next edition, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, so over the years, uh, it's compiled, compiled uh, 250 case studies and overviews across 80 different countries. Uh, and it's a truly collaborative effort, so it's involved contributions from over 400 people and from dozens of different organisations. Um, the overall objective of Shelter Projects is to learn from past experiences uh, and then to use that learning um, to, to inform current and, and future practice. Um, and the aim is really to build a, a body of evidence for the sector, and this body of evidence can, can then be used um, by multiple audiences and, and in different ways, so for, for training, for workshops, for advocacy, um, to inform strategy development and to, to inform research. Um, important to note also that uh, projects are presented anonymously. Uh, the reason for this being that as the aim is to really draw out as much learning as possible, it's thought that, that by doing it anonymously it means that we can sort of get into the, the sort of the learning around challenges and, and lessons that could be learned um, in a bit more depth. Um, and then also just to say that uh, in addition to the seven um, different editions that have been published. There's also a, a series of thematic booklets that groups some of the some of the case studies together thematically. So, so a number in terms of uh, different geographical re regions and themes around shelter for cash, for example, uh, sorry, cash for shelter and um, uh, urban programming, for example. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and and all of the case studies are found on the Shelter Projects website, so shelterprojects.org. Uh, they're all there and it's fully searchable. Um, also, just to note that on the website now, there are a number of um, case studies that have been translated. So on the translations page, there's, there's a selection of case studies that are in Arabic and French and Spanish. Uh, next page, sorry, slide. Um, and so for the next edition, um, we currently have a, a call for abstracts open um, for people to submit abstracts of, of case studies that could be um, included within Shelter Projects 2019-20, which will be the next, uh, the next edition. The call for abstracts has been open for the last couple of months um, and it was due to close today. However, we're gonna um, extend it um, and keep it open for at least a few more weeks. Um, so if you do have projects that, that could be included as case studies, um, then please do check out the submissions page of the Shelter Projects website for a bit more information on, 
on criteria and how to submit. Um, also, if you um, if you'd be able to help us by sort of spreading the word by sharing this with with colleagues and and your wider networks, um, that would be super helpful. Um, specifically, um, specifically, it would be really helpful if uh, if um, if there are any sort of well, one of, one of the gaps is often around um, uh, case studies from um, from of, of projects um, undertaken by uh, by local organisations and by by host governments. So if you have any links to to, to local organisations or, or host governments who um, you think might be interested in, in submitting abstracts, then please do share um, share details in relation to that. Also in relation to yesterday, Charles gave a little overview at the beginning around the, the health and shelter day yesterday. And one thing that was mentioned was around the potential to maybe look at trying to um, gather some case studies that specifically highlight the links between shelter and health. So where health has been a, a key focus of a shelter project. So if that is something that, uh, that you perhaps have uh, examples of projects that, that could highlight that health aspect, then that would be particularly of interest as well. Um, so, so yes, please do visit the website and if you have any questions either about um, potential um, case studies for the upcoming edition or questions just more generally about shelter projects then please do get in touch um, at the email on this slide there. Thank you. Great, thank you very much and again perfect timing so the, this, everyone is doing very well with the timing. I'm going to very quickly rattle through one slide of my own announcement which is just uh, for everyone's awareness um, Many of you may have used engineers in engineering in emergencies at some point in your career. Um, a lot of it is quite out of date now. There's a project to update it because of partly because of COVID, it's had to be scaled back slightly. But there will be a review and update to engineering in emergencies happening in the next few months. Um, should hopefully ready by the end of the year. Um, I will send out a survey to the UK Shelter Forum email list. Um, fairly soon after this um, asking for people's input on what a review on of the shelter chapter in particular the shelter and infrastructure chapter should look like and what changes people should would like to see um, I'd be very grateful if people send their responses especially if you have used this book or, or still use it um, if anyone has any strong feelings or strong ideas about this please get in touch with me directly on the email on the slides tom.newby at viewerhuppold.com and if anyone isn't on the UK shelter forum email list do sign up um, because then you get to join more of these meetings. Um, and that is that is that. So with that, we go on to the slightly longer presentations. Um, and the first one uh, is Tom Bamforth on remote shelter support in Vanuatu. Tom, are you on the call? I couldn't find you before. Yes, I am. Ah, Can you excellent. hear me? Good. Go ahead. Great. All uh, right. Great. Yeah, so I just wanted to talk about um, uh, uh, Cyclone, Tropical Cyclone Harold. Um, which hit Vanuatu um, uh, in the first week of, um, of April. Um, and this has come up a little bit um, in discussion in Australia in particular and um, in uh, academia and also some of the development, um, development actors and commentators around the, the idea of um, localization in the context of COVID-19 in the Pacific. Um, so I'll talk a bit, um, maybe just on to the next slide, please, Tom. Um, so I'll talk a bit about um, Vanuatu, about current response, um, about the content of what the localization. Um, so I suppose the first thing to say is that this is a, a massive um, cyclone in the context of Vanuatu. Um, it was uh, it uh, damaged about seventeen thousand. Uh, ha household. So this is this effective, you know, affected nearly a third of the population. It's quite a small country with only about 300,000 people. And there have been no cases of COVID-19 um, in Vanuatu. So one of the things that the government was very keen to do was to ensure that aid workers didn't arrive um, to keep uh, COVID-19 out, out of the country, um, understandably. Um, so we have a, a, an example of a, a totally locally uh, led response. Um, uh, um, TC Harold uh, builds on the experience of um, other cyclones in the Pacific, particularly Winston in Fiji in uh, 2017 uh, and uh, Gita in Tonga 
2019, and also particularly uh, Cyclone Pam, which hit Vanuatu in, uh, in 2015. And Pam was in many ways the opposite. This was an example of a, of a major international uh, intervention. It occurred at the same time as the Sendai Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. Vanuatu was in the spotlight, uh, and there are all sorts of criticisms around this. Um, one of the reports about it um, uh, said that one size doesn't fit all in terms of the humanitarian response, that this was inappropriate and rather overwhelming. And so subsequent disasters in the Pacific and subsequent governments have really used PAM as a basis. And the mantra you often hear is that we won't be another PAM. So Fiji uh, was a very strongly government-led response. as a military government there, or quasi-military government. Um, there. Uh, it was led by the military in Tonga. They also wanted a very strongly government-led re led response. Um, uh, it didn't involve the military so much, but it was, uh, it was um, aid, aid agencies and aid workers were kind of kept very much um, in, the, in the background. And so I suppose the overall point about this is that localization in different ways has been happening in the, in the Pacific and the aid agencies have been adjusting and adapting uh, to new contexts uh, since 2015. Uh, next, please, Tom. So in terms of what's being discussed, certainly in Australia anyway, um, sorry, next slide. Yeah, great. Um, so um, David Sanderson and Meg, Meg Keane, both academics, one from the University of New South Wales, the other from the Australian National University, talked about um, uh, that the big difference this time um, would be that external humanitarian saviors will be scarce on the ground, um, but perhaps the current situation will create a space for more locally driven and flexible responses. Um, and they talked about uh, it being demand driven rather than supply driven um, um, and also the reduction of international aid agencies um, would reduce aid silos and this would somehow um, um, enable um, uh, an, 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 the adoption of a, an area-based approach um, because um, local communities would decide what their what their needs were and these wouldn't fit within the, uh, the standard sort of aid silos so they presented quite an optimistic uh, view of what COVID-19 meant for Vanuatu and it's linked there to their article um, if you want to have a look at it uh, next. Um, similarly, um, Chris Roach and Fiona Tapi from the Australian National University and the Australian Red Cross uh, had a, 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 suppose a similar idea. Uh, they talked about um, that uh, COVID-19 in Vanuatu undermines the self-serving political economy of the aid sector and that local services and people uh, would step up uh, only this time the efforts would be less likely to be camouflaged or marginalized by the international partners. And next. Um, and so this is the sorts of things that I suppose are being discussed in the, in the, um, uh, the sort of by development and aid commentators. Here, um, Fiona and uh, Chris Roach and Fiona Tapi talked about um, that this could be a, a tipping point that leads to an end of the undermining of Pacific knowledge and expertise. Um, and there's a link there to their article as well, if you're interested. And next. So um, there's quite a lot of optimism, as you can see from some of those statements and those, um, those sort of articles. And so what I wanted to do was just talk briefly about what's the current situation in Vanuatu and how, what, that, uh, what I think that means for, for localization. Um, so the situation is that the, the, the response is being led by the public works department. This focuses on infrastructure, not so much shelter, and the public works people are, are often torn in a number of different directions. Um, there's no particular local um, designated focal point for uh, exclusively for shelter. Um, there are relatively few agencies uh, operating in shelter. Um, there's about five that we, um, that we count, really only two or three significant ones, um, mainly with international um, support. As a consequence of that, the coordination services um, are being offered uh, remotely. And really that's, that's very much as usual, the same sorts of um, support is being provided um, remotely as would be uh, in country, although without a designated focal point, um, it gets a bit difficult to, um, um, to sort of be amongst the nitty gritty uh, and to advocate and to form connections and develop policies and so on. So everything's being, the same things are being done as in a normal cluster, but um, the situation is a, is a lot more difficult without a designated focal point in the country. Uh, next. Um, so there's some support, I suppose, for, um, for the, uh, the sort of optimistic assessments of, the, of some of the commentators. But it is led by the National Disaster Management Organization. It's led by Lion Ministries. There's a, uh, there was a process of, of uh, decentralization of um, the aid response 
uh, in Vanuatu. So the provincial emergency operations centers in the provinces that have been affected um, have, uh, have worked quite effectively. Um, there are some developing partnerships with local organizations um, at the community level uh, through church structures and uh, organizations like the Vanuatu Red Cross. So there are good, some good things to be said about it. The meetings are held in Bislama, the local language, uh, rather than in English. They, respect, they reflect a, a greater diversity of voices than perhaps uh, we would have had during uh, Cyclone Pam, where it was very internationally dominated. Uh, next. Um, however, I mean, there are a number of significant challenges. Uh, this is a, a major disaster in the Vanuatu context. The authorities are stretched, the capacities of uh, local organizations are stretched as they are of communities. Um, there's limited coordination uh, within the government, between ministries, with the National Disaster Management Organization and between the central government and the provinces. Um, processes that would, we would usually rely on for information gathering, like the rapid assessment, that was done took an awfully long time and um, re returned really no usable data um, at all. So we're very much in the, in the dark about what the situation is. Um, most of the relief stocks um, have been consigned to the national authorities and there's no particular evidence that these are currently being distributed. So there are major problems around the, the, um, the uh, response um, without international assistance. Uh, next. So I suppose this leads to a, a some sort of reflections about what this means. And I, I don't think um, that some of the more optimistic uh, assessments uh, really um, stand up much. I don't think this is a great example of what localization could be. I think there are other um, uh, descriptors that might be more appropriate. Forced localization was one. Nationalized isolation was another. Uh, neglect, I think, would be um, a not wholly inaccurate third. Um, um, I suppose the overall point uh, in terms of the progression of disasters in the Pacific and the history of international intervention uh, is that each Pacific response, in each Pacific response, there's been a renegotiation of what localization means, and that's to be set to, to continue after this. Um, and that importantly, um, 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 that for localization to be effective, it will require, in Pacific context at least, uh, sustained investment. Uh, in deeper and longer term partnerships between international and national response actors. Um, so um, that's it. If people are interested, I have a, a, um, a, an article in response to um, the two uh, articles that I, I talked about in this presentation. That's on the Dev Policy website, and I can put the link in the, uh, in the chat uh, a bit later, uh, if you'd like. Thank you. Thank you. That's hugely, hugely thought provoking. I've just actually put the link to it in the chat. Because I read oh, it, it's very, it's very, it's very interesting, really good article. Um, uh, so uh, I'm sure there'll be questions about that either in the chat or in the discussion at the end. Um, yeah. With that, we go on to uh, Rob Robert Trigwell from IOM. This is not one of his slides. I don't think this is still one of yours. I think there we go. Um, uh, talking from the development track. Tracking Matrix talking about the impact of COVID-19 on migrants, IDPs and global mobility. Over to you, Rob. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, I hope everyone's well. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Rob and I work for um, IOM and more specifically I'm part of the, um, the Displacement Tracking Matrix team and I'll give a bit of an overview today of how we've um, changed our operations in, in the light of COVID-19 and how we're trying to um, make res the responses more data-driven as a result. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Tom? So really quickly, for those that don't know who, uh, who may not be familiar with, um, with DTM, is that we're essentially, we're a primary data collection tool working in high mobility and humanitarian environments, collecting information about mobility, vulnerabilities, needs on displaced uh, mobile populations to basically uh, get that information, integrate it into the coordination mechanisms and make uh, programming, decision-making more um, evidence-based and more context-specific. Um, the um, Because we're a primary data collection tool, um, our, our operations have been impacted quite a lot. So we've um, we've kind of switched our focus a little bit. Um, Tom, can I have the next slide, please? So, um, so now we're... Um, as the as IOM and um, the, the UN Migration Agency, we've been looking at we haven't been looking at specifically 
the like say the prevalence rates of COVID, but we have been looking at the impacts on mobility as a result, particularly of uh, all the restrictions on mobility that have been put in place and obviously the impacts of those. So we've got a number of different work streams going on, looking at how um, how points of entry, um, which I'll get into in just a second, have um, have closed or there's extra restrictions. Um, or there's partial there's partial movement, and then the impacts of that and how that has maybe caused um, a, a, a term we're using called stranded migrants, um, looking at evicted migrants, and also the exacerbation of vulnerabilities in already existing um, displacement sites such as um, RDP sites in South Sudan, for example. Um, Tom, can I have the next slide, please? So. Yeah, so our biggest activity, um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to jump to the next slide just because it's probably a bit easier showing it um, visually. Um, so our main activity here is to essentially um, map um, through the IOM network, um, is to map um, as many of the points of entry as we possibly can. So currently the map rep um, shows um, all of the uh, airports uh, blue ports, so blue ports being sea ports, river ports and lake ports um, and um, internal crossings and um, in, sorry, international land crossings, but also internal move, like uh, busy movement points. Uh, so we've got, we've, we've mapped 460, 4,680 of these, um, understanding about the, um, the movement, how, if they're open, if they're partially closed, if there's certain restrictions in place. I can share the link to the web map um, of this. This is all very interactive and it gets, um, it gets now, it was being updated daily. Um, it's now being updated every Thursday and it's being fed directly through country missions, but it's also complemented with um, a aerial module. So, um, so the country teams can also map areas or administrative units or specific sites, maybe, um, you know, maybe um, transit centres that were that are hosting um, that are hosting people that have been affected as a result of these mobility restrictions. Um, yes, um, Tom, can I have the next slide, please? So, so basically, we've we've we assessed all of the well we're, it's a, the 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 points of entry work is a continuous assessment it's it's ongoing um and countries can update um the their various points um as a mean as and when restrictions change so for example the uk's restrictions changed um last week to what they were so the, the points on the previous map were green um that, that's a little bit out of date as when the update happens uh, um um, for next week that'll be updated. So basically the first point, the first activity was understanding impacts on mobility, um, impacts on movement. And now the, the, the work is looking at what are the impacts as a result of that. So are people being evicted? Are people, um, are migrant um, stranded at border crossings? Um, is there, is there various, um, yeah, heightened vulnerabilities is this. And so that's our stranded migrant work. And then the additional work stream is the, um, for our relationship with the camp coordination, camp management clusters, uh, IOM and our CCM programs in country, we're now mapping, um, we're now doing an, an additional work stream that is mapping and assessing um, sites that were pre-existing before COVID. So sites, so we've, we, we witnessed, um, for example, camp-like settings um, happening on the Pakistan-Afghanistan border as a result of the border closures. And then when um, they were there for about three weeks, so, but then when the border opened, then um, that, that those sites were essentially closed uh, or no longer needed to exist anymore. Um, and that is, that's in our kind of core in our POE area work that I briefly mentioned. And then, so the, uh, the, the work stream on the slide at the moment is looking at the impacts on the IDP sites, the pre-existing sites. So I believe there's a colleague uh, later speaking a bit about identity, but it's similar to that. So it's looking at how, um, how vulnerabilities have been exacerbated um, because of COVID. So looking at uh, camp numbers, population, open space, 
um, restrictions of humanitarian access, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And all of this goes into a weekly, um, sorry, bi-weekly report um, that is also published, um, looking at yeah the impacts on the kind of humanitarian conditions in pre-existing humanitarian sites. Um, and if, um, yeah, is there, is there one more slide, Tom? Or is there, I think that's it. I did add an extra slide in. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. So this is a visual. So this isn't the nicest looking at maps, but this is a demonstration of how the data the DTM collects, for example, number of people across different sites, plus the open space. You can um, you can identify kind of congestion rates and density, and may use that to um, to maybe inform the direction of um, discussions about um, you know COVID containment measures and so on. So um, this this is just a really um, quick quick um, insight into so many activities that DTM has kind of been doing. All of this is um, coordinated by the global team, and um, all of the data being collected is is remote because we you know a lot a lot a lot of our access has been um, has been limited. Um, I did add one slide in, but I don't think that managed to make the presentation. So I'll, I will just talk about it. Um, and one other activity we've been doing is that um, we've had presence in the field monitoring uh, migration, traditional migration routes and identifying migration corridors for a number of years now. So we, um, we call this our network mapping. And again, I can share the link online. Um, and we've basically, we've, we've gone through our historical records of um, where migrants are commonly moving across um, or where migration is commonly moving, I should say, across um, across East and West Africa, Europe, etc., and we're identifying common routes of movement. Um, kind of pre-COVID, um, some of the data is 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 as of date uh, is as recent as March, but five years is historical movement to identify the migration routes, and then we're flagging that as is if movement is if we're working on a hypothesis that movement probably won't change route it may cease to operate or it will continue the same route so then we're sharing that data with say the who to inform them of the kind of like where the busy traffic is where the busy movement is to hopefully inform where maybe covid tracing or better prevention measures can take place um, um i i sent the slide a little bit late to tom for that to that to be added in so i'll share the link i'll share this um the links to that and that's called our network mapping so basically looking at the historical trends trying to figure out where me, people are moving to, whether it's into the congested urban areas or whether it's more dissipated across countries. And we differentiate between the, inf the people moving into the country and also the people that are moving out of the country. And again, so you can tailor the, the relevant COVID operation. And uh, that gives me about 15 seconds left. So I will call it a day there and uh, many thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Very interesting work. Uh, some very interesting um, information available there, I think. Um, right, we go to our last presentation just before the break, which is Anna Noonan from Habitat for Humanity talking about adapting existing programmes to COVID-19. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom. Yeah. We can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so, as many of you know, Habitat um, operates in 70 countries across the globe. We are dealing with very different contexts. Um, and at this time, we have national organizations doing several levels of responses. Um, and as we've all experienced, there have been many challenges brought on by the pandemic, uh, the mobility limitations, lockdown, significant working, remote working capability challenges in many countries. Um, and as part of trying to respond effectively, um, the federated model has brought its unique challenges as well. Um, we have developed the following framework on the screen to guide our programmatic options in response to COVID. So responding to the dual health and economic crises caused by COVID through Habitat's core competency in shelter. Um, so we're going to kind of just very briefly delve into these kind of four boxes in the next 10 minutes. So um, we can go ahead to the next one, Tom, and then quickly to the following one of adapting our current programming. So 
I'm not going to be reading any of or all of this text at all, but um, just to kind of give a brief idea of what we're doing to kind of shift our programming um, beyond adding new COVID focused programming is applying a disaster risk reduction resiliency lens to support communities to and also get ready to prepare for a natural disaster striking while the pandemic remains a threat. Um, we're continuing to support family driven construction activities and adapt this work to enhance and promote health oriented solutions. Um, and as all of us are doing figuring out new ways in which to conduct service delivery um, through remote interface. So we can go to the quickly through the next two for the health crisis. Thanks, Tom. Um, so working to reduce the transmission in vulnerable and disaster affected communities during quarantine measures and upon gradual reopening and possible repeat infection spikes. So we're trying to plan ahead for what could be a much longer term um, kind of up and down is in programming. So we're doing this through the provision of critical home hygiene kits, improving housing conditions, providing temporary sheltering options, and public awareness campaigns. Um, some of the activities already being undertaken in our network that fall into these categories are um, significant home sanitation hygiene kit support, but accompanied by awareness campaign materials um, designed to improve hygiene practices. Temporary housing for frontline workers through unique partnerships with hotel chains and um, also utilizing homes that have not been um, or given to uh, like families at this time um, and as well as loan forbearance for habitat partner families. Um, and we can just keep flying through on the economic crisis. So this programmatic area focuses on supporting families that have been economically impacted by COVID-19 um, through improving housing affordability, housing related employment generation, and helping housing markets in crisis recover. So in the productive housing category, we're looking to support families with home-based businesses to expand or improve their home to allow reactivation or improvement of their livelihoods. Uh, supporting homeowners to expand and provide additional rental income as well as supporting housing stock. Um, at this time, we've been working to convene key public and private sector stakeholders on the recovery of housing market affordability and for investment in quality housing as a driver of health outcomes and economic recovery globally. Um, I want to say to note, we've seen incredible coordination across our multiple technical teams at HFHI, um, which I think is a testament, especially seen in this economic crisis lens. Um, we've worked closely with our colleagues in the Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter at HFHI, who do lead most of our market-based work. And so I think that that's been a very um, positive outcome that we've seen internally from creating this framework for a response. Um, and then finally, moving forward, please, Tom, to our last section on advocacy. Um, so it's important that throughout all of these phases, we continue to advocate across all of our programming for governments and stakeholders to address the housing related needs of the most vulnerable. Um, so we've been encouraging the Global Habitat Network to use its voice to highlight the government's responsibility to protect housing as the first line of defense against COVID-19 and recognize the centrality of the housing sector in supporting economic recovery as well. So the key areas that we've been advocating for and which many of our national organizations have already put pressure on their governments to incorporate are protecting the adequacy, affordability, accessibility, and stability of housing. Um, also to address the immediate financial needs of individuals during the pandemic and ensure the sustainability of housing construction markets to ensure swift recovery. Um, addressing the specific needs of informal settlements in fighting this pandemic. Um, and finally, ensuring direct engagement with community leaders and groups in COVID-19 responses and plans. So that is our intertwined amongst all of our programming is advocacy. 
And then just the final slide, please, Tom. Um, so just recognizing that while this is our framework, we believe that effective solutions, um, particularly in order to solve some of the great challenges brought about by this pandemic, require multiple partnerships involving communities, municipalities, organizations, civil society, research institutions, and relevant government departments to be successful. Um, so I just want to say thank you and that we're here to learn and share and promote the ideas of others. So I'll uh, look at any questions after this and thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to see how uh, our specialist housing agencies responding to this. So I think that's for some interesting things to think about for the discussion at the end. Um, that brings us perfectly on time to the break, which I did not expect, but thank you everyone for, for doing the, the presentations in exactly the right amount of time. So we have 20 minutes for you to go make a cup of tea, have a glass of wine, or do whatever else you feel like doing. Um, we will be trying to set up these breakout rooms. Um, you will be randomly allocated to one. Um, feel free to talk to people in it. If you don't want to, that is not compulsory, but do be back. Uh, just before 3.20 when we will restart with a presentation from UNHCR in Latin America. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so I will leave it to Step to set these meeting rooms up. So maybe Step, you can explain what's going to happen. Um, well, yes, as Tom said, um, you'll be randomly allocated to one of six rooms and then we'll pull you back just before 20 past. So hopefully the technology will work about now.
Depp, I no longer seem to be host. Can you make me host again? Um, yep, hold on. Thank you. Right, did that work, Tom? Yes. Thank Great. You. And people should be coming out of breakout rooms about now. In 46 seconds, it says. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right, so everyone should be back, I hope now. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen again. Um, and the, we'll go straight into the next set of three presentations. Um, and the first is Raphael Neri from UNHCR in talking about the uh, UNHCR Shelton Settlement response in Latin America. Are you there, Raphael? Yes. Great, go ahead. Hi there. Hi, Tom. Hi, everybody. Okay, thanks for the space, first of all. Yeah, I'm recently moved to the region and I'm going to be talking especially, not necessarily about, uh, I mean, the sheltered response, but in the context of COVID, okay? I used to say something, you know, um, two, three years ago, we didn't have one shelter expert in the region. Today, we are 25, okay? And uh, I want to put this in context, please. Uh, next uh, slide, Tom. So it is important to just to give a little a bit, a bit of context. Huh? These are projections of uh, persons of concern for UNACR by the end of 2020. This was done pre-COVID, but nevertheless it remains uh, very relevant. We're talking about 82 million persons of concern around the world, and out of that number, 23% the highest number are in this continent continent now so there has been a shift in the in the situations around the world we can see that if we look at the numbers from the end of 2017 we 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 have gone double we were at 12 percent of people of concerns were in the americas and now we are going up to 23 percent unfortunately you know the let's say the budget doesn't necessarily um, you know have gone higher or double the same way the situation so we 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 do struggle in this region um, to to fund uh, and to respond to to the crisis and just take the opportunity to to bring some visibility to this continent please um tom can you go to the next one Okay, so we have four major uh, situations in the region. The Venezuela situation, which entails about 5.4 million people by the end of the, of the year. Colombia situations, and now we're talking about an IDP situation, despite, you know, the news and, and, and you know, the peace agreements, we do have uh, an immense crisis in, in this country. I'm actually based in, in Bogota and I'm the regional shelter focal point, uh, but have been based in Colombia so I can be closer to the, to the field. Then we have the North of Central America situation, which touches around a million people. And there we have a number of crises from IDP situations from Honduras, 
El Salvador, and then the, the, the whole movement towards the north. And then to finalize, we have the Nicaragua situation that touches about 100,000 people. Uh, so we are talking about internal displacement and, and, and influx going through Costa Rica and so on. In terms of COVID, these numbers that I put here are really from last week because I had to send the, the presentation to Tom a week ago. So we we're talking about that COVID wise, we were in the region, Latin America, of course, not including the states, about 8% of the cases, 6% of death in this region. Now, I have to say that uh, studies have shown that in two or three or four days, you can double these numbers. And in our region, the curve is going up at this point. It's, just, it's not like what's going on in Europe. So we expect that situation will, will get worse here. Please, Tom, next one. Let's go to the key issues before I get to the response in itself. So on one hand, we have the restrictions, no incomes, people is, 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 is really having Okay, so we have restrictions, income, uh, for people to get their income is being very difficult and they, they, they are not being able to pay their rent or the daily hotels. So this results in people uh, being, you know, forced evictions, people living in the streets. Secondly, we have uh, massive deportations. It's not that they, they, they remain the same, like in Central America, the numbers as not go higher, but what is happening is that when all these people is being deported at return to their places of origin, there are quarantine requirements being put in place. And this has completely affected the, on one hand, the, the weak uh, health uh, response system and, and just has complicated things pretty much. The third one is that people on, on, on the move, you know, we have these, we have seen these spontaneous returns, again, due to the restrictions at the fear, we have now over 50,000 Venezuelans that have gone back to Venezuela. And the, what this means is that you have movement, movement of people coming from Peru, getting stuck in the entry of Ecuador, and then moving from Ecuador to Colombia, getting stuck there. I have to say that, that uh, UNHCR, UNHCR, you know, doesn't uh, uh, agree with the return and the situation. You know, it is it is said that the situation are not conducive for a voluntary repatriation in safety and dignity. Uh, nevertheless, this is happening. You know, our effort is to 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 work with government so we can respond to refugees in in the region so that they can stay where they are but uh, this is happening all over. Then of course we have the closure, you know, due to, con or, or the confinement of existing uh, collective centers. You know, the responses in, in our region are pretty much very, very different of what we see in Africa or in the Middle East. We have no camps. We have, uh, of course, uh, the urban poor absorbing a lot of our refugees and IDPs. But then of course, we also have these albergues uh, small collective centers, and these are closing. By the beginning of the, the crisis, 25% of them, for example, in Ecuador, were closed, and 75 completely shut down. That have now reverted and, and managed to, to reopen it little by little. You know, that has to do with stigma, fear, xenophobia, so on and so forth. These are key problems in the region especially now uh, xenophobia growing uh, at a high rate. We used to see, you know, refugees uh, as, a, as an opportunity, but that's now becoming even more difficult now in terms of, you know, the fight for, for resources. Now, um, and then of course, uh, I want to finalize uh, with the need of, of, of health infrastructure and the need for expanding them. And we did play, we do play a role there uh, talking from the shelter uh, and settlement perspective, especially from the settlement perspective, looking at community infrastructure. So I will be I'll be talking about that. Next one, please. We, in terms of rep responses, the first one where we have you know shifted dramatically is in in CBI cash based information, remote support, and uh, looking at cash multi purpose. Sometimes difficult to visualize. 
uh, for us in, as shelter because they come part of a big package, but that's one of the first uh, mitigation measures against uh, evictions and people living in the streets. We are reaching about quarter million people with this uh, support. Then we are adapting existing shelters. I will show later how we do this. We are doing new collective shelters in the forms of sites, uh, using RHUs, using other, other, other solutions. Uh, we are looking at hotels as a main, main uh, solution for sheltering. We'll be discussing about that later. And as I was saying before, we are supporting the expansion of this uh, shelter capacity in terms of triage, in terms of areas for recovery patients. I have to say that all this has been done with the leadership uh, of, the, of the health sector, of course, and the health service providers, but we are fully engaged in providing that support. We know that within the humanitarian community, we are the ones that have the, you know, the architects and the, and the civil engineers and so on and so forth. So we have a play, we have had an immense play to roll there. A role to play there. Please, next one. One minute left, Rafael. Really? Okay, so yeah. let's go. These are this. No, that cannot be possible. Okay, you're right. So, spatial requirements. We adapted. You know what? Go, go for the next one. And I'm, I want to show you. Um, this is what we do in existing, but I'm going to show you a couple of. of uh, go on, go on for the next one, please. I don't know if you can show. Uh, these are RHUs being, being uh, adapted in, in, in existing buildings and these become shelters, emergency shelters. Please, next one, this is Peru. Next one, this is all over Panama, Colombia. Can you play the, the YouTube video there? It's to show. This is a facility that was done in the north of Brazil to support uh, over 8,000 refugee sites that we have there, 8,000 people in total. And this is just uh, an emergency facility to support that. This end up in, a, in an isolation center. Can you just uh, stop that one? Uh, you're gonna see the, the site there. And we go to the last one, just the last video. One more there, and you can see the type of, no, before, yeah, there. You, this is Peru, again, expansion of a health center. We have deployed about 1,200 of these RHUs in the region. It's not, it's not there, it's the other one. And, no, before, just want to show you a little bit of the, of the, yeah, of the setting of that. That's an, that's a, that's an extension of a hospital. Can you click the link right above? Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you can say play, and we can finish with that one. This is an expansion of a, of a, of a health center, as I was saying, we deployed what, like 1,200 of these RHUs into the region. We have airlifted them, and uh, it's been an immense uh, support for for uh, local governments and health centers. I'm gonna stop there then, uh, since I went too far with the context. Thanks for that. Thank you, Rafael, and. Um... Just to reiterate, the presentations are all available um, online. And exactly. we'll, um, so do ask Raphael if you have any questions. If you have any other points or links to put, put them in the chat, please, Raphael, and then people will do. see them. Thank you I'll very much. So. Cheers. Um, so we're going straight on to another presentation from UNHCR from John Wayne on dealing with density in humanitarian settlements. Are you there, John? Yes, Tom, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Good. Um, thanks, Tom. Great to see so many uh, familiar faces and uh, familiar voices. Um, congrats on organizing the forum. Um, uh, big success in difficult times. Uh, always challenging following Rafa. Um, I know how he likes to speak, um, uh, being from Venezuela. But listen, we speak quickly in Cork, so I'll try and speed things up a bit. So next slide, please. 
Yeah, um, density. So density is a key factor um, in influencing transmission pathways of COVID-19. Um, shelter and settlement interventions can help reduce the risk by increasing available shelter and housing options for those at risk and working to reduce risk posed by high density living conditions. First and foremost, COVID-19 is a public health response. We're there to support our public health colleagues Uh, we define density. Where, where's our current definitions? We're all familiar with sphere. Um, the uh, 45 square meter minimal usable surface area, again, page 251 of sphere, we're all very familiar with this. Uh, in a camp type settlement, that translates to about um, 22,200 people per square meter. Uh, from a shelter perspective, um, minimum living space 3.5 to 4.5. Again, sphere, page 255. In UNHCR, um, we, we have developed um, the master plan approach to settlement planning. So what is that? That's, that's our framework that we're using for um, defining spatial design of humanitarian settlements. Now, we've got 10 principles in the master plan and principle four deals with density. Uh, what we say in that is where possible avoid high density in rural settlements. So why the average age of a refugee settlement is about 17 years if we go with low densities we're, we're not going to have room for expansion we have to allow room for expansion settlement planners don't like that the five square meters uh, and in the master plan approach we, we haven't really alluded to that what, what we've tried to look at is, is um, a median of densities across various locations. But um, the key message is uh, high population density within humanitarian settlements uh, has been shown to increase pressure on resources and services, and it's likely um, to increase the likelihood of communal conflict and other such issues. So try and avoid um, high densities in humanitarian settlements. Uh, next slide, please. What about the urban context? So we work very closely with UN Habitat in UNHCR and UN Habitat um, have a discussion paper number three on sustainable neighborhoods. And in, in that, the, the three features of sustainable neighborhoods, compact, uh, integrated and connected, they reference at least 15,000 people per, per square kilometer in, in urban context. Now, Funnily enough, a high population density in a text is something that's perceived to be quite good. Um, a more efficient, uh, optimized service and infrastructure, um, environmental sustainability, energy efficiency. So high density is often thought as, as quite a good thing in an urban context. However, what's going to happen post COVID-19? This debate on densification versus disaggregation. Um, Personally, I think there's still a lot to run on this and, and it might indeed reopen that debate about the positivity of, of density in, in an urban context. And I think there's a lot more food for thought on that post uh, COVID-19. Next slide, please. So in UNHCR, what, what tools do we have? What support tools do we have for um, uh, supporting this issue of density, looking at the issue of density and providing support to our settlement planners worldwide? We have developed a settlement uh, information portal, which is uh, a portal of, of 690 settlements. settlements. Um, we've also developed a settlement planning toolkit, which consists of hardware and software to support colleagues, GIS software and uh, Autodesk hardware. So these are tools that can support the settlement planner in doing a lot of analyses at field level. We mentioned the master plan approach and in the master plan approach we've developed a number of annexure uh, around um, um, site, um, um, site services, uh, analyzing um, um, site capacity, um, doing um, uh, site analysis, etc. Um, we're just worked on some specific COVID-19 guidance and I'll come to that in more detail in the next couple of slides. We also have good collaboration with UNOSAT, UNITAR, and there's an example there of some of the demography maps that we can produce on population densities in particular locations. We've also worked closely with UN Habitat on uh, settlement profiling toolkit, and uh, 
that collaboration and um, we have developed frameworks for investigation at meso micro um, scales now in um, that toolkit um, and the framework for investigation we look at density issues there's a lot around uh, density analysis that we're doing there when we're looking at comprehensive spatial profiles next slide please this is just a quick snapshot of the information we have on the settlement information portal we were able to look at this very quickly and this is rough and ready and fast we were able to look at the current area of a settlement uh, and the population within that settlement uh, we were able to look at the number of shelters and the, um, the number of people per household and very rapidly come up with a system that showed us where there was potentially some density issues so we identified in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iraq, Rwanda, and Myanmar sites that have challenges from a high density perspective. And then from a shelter perspective, we identified issues around density at shelter level in Uganda, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, etc. So it was very useful for giving us a very rapid snapshot of where we potentially had uh, density challenges. Next slide, please. So one of the tools we mentioned um, was a, um, a checklist, a COVID-19 checklist, uh, and out of that then we did a case study. So what is that COVID-19 checklist? It, it, it really is just a rough guide for our UNHCR field operations um, to, to um, identify challenges with regards to uh, um, COVID-19 transmission. So it's, it's a rapid uh, preparedness and response tool um, assessing conditions in camp and camp-like context. So um, it, we're looking to um, address identified COVID-19 risks and ascertain what actions can be taken to reduce density where it's determined to be excessive at the household and at the settlement level. Uh, in addition, we're looking at existing health facilities in the particular uh, settlement and those health facilities uh, working closely with our colleagues in health, what, what capacity is necessary, and then can we identify uh, locations within that settlement to expand both the health facilities and more longer term, uh, construct additional shelter to, to, to address the density issues. Again, this is a public health emergency. We must liaise very closely with our public health colleagues and all that other relevant guidance that's been gathered and developed over the last series of weeks and months, uh, we reference it in this guidance too, and, and we ensure that, that our colleagues are alluding to that. So next slide, please. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot from the, um, the, the checklist. Uh, again, we're gathering information from settlements, population, areas, um, number of high risk um, populations, Again, high risk uh, alluding to wage and comorbidities initially, but in consultation with our health colleagues. And then very roughly looking at from both a settlement level and a household level, do we have density challenges that need addressing? In addition, we, we're doing an assessment of the health facilities that are existing within that settlement. Again, is there scope for expansion of those health facilities? or indeed, do we need to identify additional locations within that site to construct additional health facilities? So it really is a, a rapid checklist, doing an assessment of density at household and camp level, as well as looking at existing health facilities and seeing where we can come up with solutions to address the issues of both density and the need for additional uh, health facilities to support uh, with COVID-19 responses. One thing to mention, and I think it's critically important, we often have a lot of collective accommodation in, in um, refugee settlements. So these would be large scale mass shelter that's used as reception and collective facilities. These are the low hanging fruit and it's absolutely critical that we address um, the um, density issues that exist within these collective centers as an immediate priority because there is a serious risk of transmission where the density is so high in some of this. And in a, in a lot of our um, operations, that was the first thing that was addressed was 
um, uh, decommissioning collective centres and getting people into individual household uh, shelter type uh, situations. Next slide, please. Just one minute left. Thanks. Yeah, one minute. So this just shows you very briefly an overview of a site plan. We, went, we, we picked a case study, we had a look at a case study and we modified it to show some good uh, examples that our settlement planners can follow uh, both from household density, camp level density and health facilities. At the household level there on the right you can see um, extension of existing shelters or if possible construction of additional shelters on the plot. Now just to mention that while looking at COVID challenges in this sort of detail it also raised a whole load of new questions uh, and, and um, it's been a fascinating exercise for us to go into this level of detail and look at these uh, challenges and try to come up with solutions. Last slide, please. So just very quickly, what are the next steps in this? The next steps in this is wide consultation with our field-based colleagues. We had a call with 20 colleagues during the week. We're incorporating their feedback into the checklist. Um, we will then uh, uh, request that they do assessments of their respective settlements. We're there then to give technical support in the shelter and settlements section. We'll identify contextually appropriate solutions and capture good practice and put that back onto the SIP for information sharing. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks very much, John. Uh, there is actually a question for you in the chat, if you could have a look at that afterwards. Um, will do. We will move, move on now to uh, Jamie Richardson from CRS talking about their response to COVID-19. Thank you, John. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, I, I, so I don't repeat uh, actually from the last the last two presentations. I might skim over a few things, but really to just to say that uh, you know that thinking about our response in kind of two ways. One is um, you know how we are creating uh, you know new responses to to COVID, but the other one is also about having to adapt programs. So there's these kind of two elements to it. So we're looking at this in terms of kind of general uh, information about infection prevention control, um, kind of generically, and then looking at how we localize that. Um, um, and breaking that down into kind of household response, uh, collective, uh, collective center type of responses, and then also health facilities, but, and, and looking at cross-cutting issues. Next slide, please. Uh, just something about the kind of the the, the, the definitions and language. Um, I mean, here's here's an example of how we've we've kind of broken it down between isolation, quarantine, and shielding. Um, and you know what isn't mentioned here is kind of isolation in terms of of you know like we're experiencing now in terms of lockdown. Um, and what we are finding is a little bit of a challenge between uh, is is the different way that uh, definitions are being interpreted at in, at country level. So we've got to be sure that whatever advice that we provide, we we're having to adapt to whatever the local understandings are. But just just to uh, to mention that has been one of the one of the issues for us. Next slide, please. So at at household IPC level, we're just talking about kind of general principles about kind of trying to live in a healthy environment and the kind of things that you can do in terms of protecting yourself from community transmission. But also then looking at those quarantine and isolation. Um, um, arrangements that you might want to make at household level but just kind of impressing you know creating these kind of barriers between people who are infected or not infected or, or suspected and and trying to give some practical examples so for, for the different countries we're working and we're trying to look at the housing typologies and then coming up with with a uh, an appropriate uh, kind of IEC to support that next slide please the, in response to the shielding paper that was uh, the, developed by the um, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where they were particularly looking at the Rohingya camp, um, some of the discussion about household, uh, neighbourhood level and sector level, um, one area that we thought was kind of um, most appropriate for you know, us as an organisation and partners was thinking about shielding. And I'd say that shielding, uh, through our connection with the different country programmes, is, is coming up at a household level, coming up more and more as, as something that people are really interested in doing because they're seeing that without adequate health facilities, uh, people who are at risk, shielding is probably the most likely option for them. Um, and so we, we have to be thinking about the, the kind of hardware and software components of that. And, I'd, and I think that uh, actually focusing on the software components is particularly, um, particularly relevant because of the um, the the, the, the long-term um, 
aspect of it. It's going to the people are going to be have to be shielded for some time. So how we help families in that way is really important. Uh, next slide, please. And we have a, a, a cash and market team, and we're looking at trying to support economies in that have been affected and communities that have been affected by this. And through discussions around that, it was it was how to help you know market traders, shopkeepers, and also people who were kind of been involved with any kind of interface with with um, um, with communities, coming up with with ideas of of providing kind of some kind of protection around that. And so there's a um, there's some examples that we were providing just as a, as a kind of schematics and then also as um, we're actually doing some kind of you know pilots and testing on that and this was from Iraq on the right hand side. Next slide please. One area that is coming up is around collective centres and there's quite a discussion around this at the moment and, and uh, um, the Asia uh, region of CRS has been developing a guideline for evacuation centres, given that there is, you know, cyclone season for, you know, coming up. So India, Bangladesh, others that are looking at what they're going to do in um, in a response and the impacts that COVID may have on that, in terms of um, people maybe not wanting to go there, the stigma and the issues that may be connected around that. What kind of arrangements or what would be the key messages that we might want to have within collective centres where we know that they're going to be very crowded. You know, where, where actually providing any sort of separation is really difficult. So then it, it's actually down to um, looking at trying to prevent people moving around too much um, to reduce the kind of um, the, the, the risk of spreading within these centres. So this is something we're, we're working on at the moment and also looking at, you know, what the, the, the mapping of other resources outside of um, the collective centres that could be used as alternative buildings for, for, for as evacuation centres in the in the event of, uh, you know, cyclo in the event of cyclone or, or, or other disasters. Um, and other requests that were coming in, there was one from Mexico that was looking at migration centres, looking at the kind of spatial arrangements and they're coming up with ideas of how we, we could create kind of quarantine and isolation um, ideas within those. So um, what I'd say is that we've we pr produced a set of kind of guidelines which we shared with all the country programmes then, and then we go and work individually with those country programmes to deal with, with the, 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 the detailed um, issues that they have. Next slide, please. Um, we have an infrastructure team and that infrastructure team has been working, one of the things that's been working on um, is supporting the uh, HRIP, which is the Housing Reconstruction Recovery Platform in Nepal, which has been requested by the Ministry of Health to, to help them to come up with ideas for quarantine centres. And, and this is across the whole of the country, bearing in mind that so many migrant workers in Nepal are returning. And um, the issue of migrants is, is something that has come up in a few programs in, in India, for example, also that they have uh, people who are living in the urban areas wanting to return home or are not able to, uh, who are now stuck in the cities and, and, and can't rent anymore and are finding themselves you know, um, homeless. Uh, is one of the kind of migrant issues. The other one is about you know people returning, wanting to return home, and then being quarantined before they enter those com their community. So this is an example from Nepal, um, and and there's another um, uh, the uh, team in Indonesia are, are currently are working with the with the shelter cluster to help develop those concepts there as well. Next slide, please. Um, the same team, the infrastructure team, has been having requests for. Uh, support with health facilities and there is on the left hand side are some of the kind of generic ideas about about uh, you know, kind of layouts and expansions to health facilities to to assist our partners to be able to support um, hospitals um, and I think this one was coming from um, Afghanistan another one in Ethiopia next slide please and including um, you know how we can use uh, um, off-the-shelf resources like uh, you know um, medical tents and how they can be divided and used. Um, the image isn't so great, but it does show the division inside and the kind of layout and the separation that we may achieve from that and kind of the essential services that go with it. So that's the kind of scope of what we've been working on at the moment. Um, but there are kind of cross-cutting issues. Um, so next slide, please. And one that's uh, actually come up quite a lot now and we're, we're, we're supporting our country programmes with is around um, is around uh, COVID and uh, site safety um, to so that we're providing kind of recommendations upon 
how sites may continue to operate and you know provide separation and safety for those people within their um, uh, within the work. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, another piece of sort of generic, uh, you know, cross-cutting um, information that we have within our within our um, HRD humanitarian response department is around kind of guidelines around distribution. So just and, and this is useful for 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 our shelter departments as well. So you know where we have shelter programs, ongoing shelter programs, um, having distribution or reconsidering how the logistics around distribution um, is as, as of interest to our programs. Uh, you know, one thing that we're finding is, um, you know, around the discussion is where we've been promoting uh, cash programming, cash and market-based programming, um, having to review those programs to see how we can provide choice within those shelter programs whilst kind of trying to reduce the amount of contact that people need to have. Um, this is this is something new that we're having to look at and there are two or three programs that we're, we're going through that process with them. Next slide, please. One minute, Jamie. And and of course, you know the the gender and protection kind of component of this is that all of this means different things to different people, um, and so just to making sure that you know that through all of this we are continuing to to look at this through our gender protection lens because there are obviously people, especially who are in uh, shielded, being shielded, etc., in isolation that that may be vulnerable in lots of different ways. Um, one of the, the, the discussions with the protection team is about the accountability and report uh, the, the accountability systems that we might need to put in place, such as providing phones and you know, top ups on cards, etc. Uh, last slide, please. So some of the issues just to flag up: uh, one is around migrant workers. Um, um, the, the, the thought of kind of protected uh, isolation, the impacts on livelihood, mental health, and and protection, which I've kind of touched on, but particularly kind of mental health and psychosocial support for that protected isolation for people being shielded. Um, and then, you know, the other challenge that we have is about our program delays, our cost extensions, diverted resources that we're having from existing programming that, that is obviously going to have impact um, beyond COVID, you know, that's the, the secondary impact of COVID, which I think we may yet see in terms of um, how people's lives, livelihood, health, et cetera, may be um, impacted in other ways other than COVID. So, uh, Yes, that's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, so now we go straight into uh, our final presentation, which is from the co-lead of the Global Shelter Cluster to set the scene for the discussion we'll have at the end uh, on the role of shelter in a global health emergency. So hopefully all of the presentations so far have been helping set the scene. And now uh, Ella and Brett from IFRC and UNHCR will give us an introduction to the topic and then we will go into the discussion. Over to you, Ella and Brett. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think uh, we can immediately go to the uh, second slide, Tom. Um, I mean, we have already heard a lot of uh, interesting uh, um, issues that came up and, uh, and very good examples. So I think we'll go through uh, the presentation quite quickly. Uh, we just want to um, uh, sh discuss with you what uh, has been happening on the coordination side and uh, maybe go through a little bit of the response options, but uh, uh, many of uh, you already, uh, the three presentations before us uh, um, has already hi uh, highlighted uh, a menu of options. And then uh, we want to um, discuss uh, with you or present to you uh, the opportunities and challenges uh, as far as we could uh, identify it and then um, Hopefully, we will have a good discussion about what uh, what COVID uh, or health uh, pandemics mean for our uh, sector. We can go to the next one. So I think um, we have been saying it many, many times. Uh, the scope of our sector is uh, is uh, quite broad, and uh, this is also being uh, uh, seen in the in the COVID response. Obviously. Uh, Already, uh, John talked about the density in the in the in the camps or the, or the settlements. We have uh, in uh, adequate conditions that have a huge health uh, impact on people's uh, um, uh, has a huge health impact that was discussed all day yesterday. We of course have um, 
um, informal settlements and the huge uh, density issue in uh, urban areas. So we see all of these issues, of course, having um, having an influence on how we respond to COVID-19 um, and, uh, of course, also other health emergencies. I will not uh, labor the issue that much because already uh, the speakers before us have uh, discussed the uh, uh, very relevant uh, points. So uh, just uh, just um, kind of setting the scene for the rest of the presentation, I will uh, hand over to Brett to talk about what has been happening on the coordination uh, side, uh, because maybe not all of you um, are uh, connected to uh, the different uh, coordination mechanisms and uh, for you to have an idea on um, how they all um, inter interrelate in the in the COVID response. Over to you, Brett. Thanks, Ella, um, for the introduction and kicking off with everything. And, and thanks, uh, as mentioned, to CARE for hosting. It's been a really good discussion so far. Um, we can go into the next slide, please, Tom. <clears throat> so here on the operational challenges side, um, the role that Ella and I both have in terms of the cluster coordination aspect is, of course, um, linking through to the interagency coordination mechanism. Now, normally we have a monthly GCCG meeting, Global Cluster Coordinators Group, but since COVID-19, it's been weekly. And one thing that I just want to mention here is the operational coordination aspect. Um, I won't go into too much detail on it, actually, but one thing for everyone to note is that we've got kind of three coordination processes going on at the global level. There's the um, WHO coordination process, there's the cluster coordination process, and then there is also the development actors coordination process going on. And each of those three mechanisms are a response mechanism and they're all raising money. For the shelter cluster coordination, of course, the COVID-19 response is a whole of society approach, meaning that it really is at the behest of the national government and their Ministry of Health with support from WHO to frame the nature of the response in any one country. And traditionally, of course, the humanitarian system, we um, respond to people that are displaced, uh, whether they're refugees, IDPs. But how do we link to a whole of society approach that's already happening in the relevant country and coordinate within that larger national system? So there's quite a bit of discussion in the first few weeks on how we pivot the humanitarian approach. And soon it was agreed with OCHA that we would have this virtual platform that's been coordinated in tandem with WHO. So what we've actually found is a very rapid switch to all the clusters and their relevant processes, whether it be um, operational guidance, um, indicators, objectives, linking more to a health outcome. Now, this is very strange because for the last 15 years, it's a rights-based approach and it's linking more to a protection approach. So the whole system has been reframed very, very rapidly, which presents all of us with some very interesting challenges, but also some really interesting opportunities um, because the location of the interventions happen in a specific place. So we're, we're finding ourselves much easier to move toward integrated um, development, solutions oriented approaches and bringing those stakeholders on board right from the beginning. Next one, please, Tom. So how's it working with the existing coordination mechanism? I mean, we've got around 30 coordination mechanisms active globally from the shelter cluster perspective, and they all produce um, a HRP, a humanitarian response plan, built on the evidence gained through the HNO, the humanitarian needs overview. That's all coordinated at the local level and then it comes through globally. What we actually have now found with the global HRP is that there's a series of processes that are part of the COVID-19 response that each field cluster has to go through an amendment to work toward. So we wanna try and keep the same indicators, the same processes, so we don't have parallel responses being coordinated locally. We've got some complications, of course, there's a refugee coordination mechanism, there's regional response mechanisms, and also there are a lot of countries that are now 
deemed to be priority countries where there was no humanitarian response, no humanitarian coordination mechanism, and it's come to the responsibility of the RC slash HC, the resident coordinator slash humanitarian coordinator to take on that role. And in those countries where you don't have many humanitarian actors, this is actually a, a challenging process. And so this week, for example, each of the clusters have been pulling together a minimum kit of what are the tools or processes required in the countries where there is a COVID-19 response from the humanitarian community, but with no pre-existing coordination mechanism. Next one, please, Tom. So, um, Ella, I think this one's on to you. You're on mute, I think. Yes. I could not turn on the video and the um, uh, microphone at the same time. Um, so from the operation side, um, we already had, uh, heard really good examples. I think uh, the kind of activities that uh, we're all looking into are um, uh, can be uh, categorized in, the, in, in two ways. So we're all looking at uh, adapting our uh, ongoing programs to the COVID-19 uh, reality. I mean, uh, uh, distancing uh, uh, people while they're um, uh, having uh, distributions or adapting, trying to decongest uh, existing uh, uh, settlements or uh, adapting our uh, programming in uh, various different uh, ways. And then I think we all uh, also need to be alert uh, and flexible about the new um, areas of activity that could be coming our way, uh, be it maybe uh, different types of construction if uh, our agencies uh, uh, are not uh, looking at construction as part of shelter all the time, or maybe different caseloads emerging uh, that are not our usual uh, clients and still require our uh, support. Uh, for example, from the uh, IFRC side, we're seeing quite a lot of re uh, requests, especially in the uh, Western uh, countries um, for assistance uh, with uh, like homeless populations uh, or uh, quarantine, uh, facilities for people who need to uh, um, who, who are coming or returning home and they need to they cannot go to their home so uh, our national societies are dealing with this kind of new activities or new mandates that they're uh, usually not uh, dealing with so I think uh, there are uh, some activities maybe that uh, are more specific to the COVID uh, response clearly uh, our main uh, focus and scope is still the humanitarian um, humanitarian uh, populations and the, the um, people who are affected by disasters and crises but uh, i think there might also be some other uh, caseloads uh, coming in the um, coming days especially as we i think jamie was mentioning the the secondary impacts as we move into the um, longer term uh, impacts of uh, covid situation Next uh, slide, please. So on the, um, we already uh, discussed uh, and uh, heard good examples of uh, what can be done in the immediate uh, emergency uh, shelter by improving the conditions. Yesterday, of course, we heard all the links about uh, health outcomes and, and shelter. So there are very tangible and uh, uh, demonstrable, if that's a word, uh, links and um, I think we need to keep uh, communicating those uh, across the teams and uh, um, across the sector, how we can contribute uh, through the uh, improvement of the uh, emergency shelters and settlements, uh, improve the health outcomes in response uh, to COVID. Uh, next one, please. What we haven't discussed maybe that much, at least uh, not in this afternoon session, is the issue of um, uh, housing, land and property and security of uh, tenure um, as it is linked to uh, COVID. Uh, and um, maybe it has happened uh, so far uh, mostly uh, linking to uh, decongesting in informal settlements, especially uh, we have heard reports, of course, of governments uh, de decongesting uh, informal settlements and uh, along the way people uh, being evicted from their uh, homes and with uh, varying successes of uh, return 
Also, of course, there is the issue of uh, stigma that uh, has already been uh, mentioned. Uh, we have also heard reports of health workers or foreigners being evicted uh, so far by landlords because they are being seen as uh, carriers of the virus. Of course, that means that there is huge work to be done for risk communication um, and, uh, and CEA. But of course, we can also uh, foresee that uh, when people's livelihoods are affected uh, by the pandemic situation, when markets are closed or people who are um, dependent on a daily wage for their um, survival and to pay for their rent and accommodation, uh, of course, these are like seriously affected at the moment. And there'll be a bigger economic impact in the uh, coming months, even people who are um, uh, so far may be able to cover uh, their expenses may become extremely vulnerable and as such um, um, become vulnerable to forced uh, evictions. So I think that's also something that we need to uh, monitor. It's also something we're trying to uh, work together on with the um, HLP AOR um, to identify the key actions that could be taken by the shelter actors and the shelter sector including uh, some messaging. So there could be, of course, uh, uh, rental um, support programs, uh, which is something that we're quite familiar with, of course, in our sector. Uh, there's, of course, information uh, sharing, advocacy with governments and uh, other stakeholders. And of course, there, uh, there are uh, things that we can do in um, uh, counting and measuring um, number of evictions uh, um, and um, advocating against those. Um, let me see. And of course, um, I don't know if you had seen it uh, um, in the recent uh, opinion piece of the former uh, special rapporteur. Uh, the way she had framed it is that being access to adequate housing or not is a, a life or death uh, situation uh, in this case, uh, because of all the measures that are being promoted uh, to um, uh, prevent the uh, spread of uh, COVID. So if uh, people are being evicted, uh, we can uh, only imagine what it will do for their mental health and uh, for their physical health uh, in the coming days. So I think this is also something that we can do um, quite a lot of uh, work in the coming days uh, from our sector. I will uh, hand over now again uh, to Brett and um, I, I think at some point I'm coming back uh, online. You there, Brett? Yes, I am. Um, so, um, just one minute left, I'm afraid. If you can. Oh, okay. Let me go like a, as fast <laughs> as I can. Uh, Nick, next slide, please. So I think that we've uh, we we've kind of talked about really the coordination issues and the response issues, but 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 something that I can see there in the chat box and also is very pertinent. It was discussed yesterday, uh, and that is around um, the role of shelter and settlement, but also the fact that it is limited within the humanitarian moment because it's really conditional upon uh, years, if not decades, of underinvestment in adequate dwellings, adequate living conditions. And that's true for humanitarians. It's also true for people living in dense urban areas where you know we know we have around a billion people living in slums. So we can't dissociate our approaches from those. And we've seen really in the last couple of months good conversations with development actors. I um, mean, there's joint advocacy with World Bank, with OECD, with many others, because fundamentally the issues are around quality of habitation and access to safe living spaces. Uh, next one, please, Tom. Um, support to health facilities. I'll just touch on this momentarily. Um, IFRC and a lot of other actors who um, specialise in health, they're providing a lot of support to the health infrastructure aspect and I think that's a specialization that certainly is a reality at field level. We have a lot of shelter officers and shelter cluster coordinators that are working really closely with the health cluster and health actors to help support the infrastructure requirements. Uh, and next one please Tom. And the opportunities. We've got one more slide after this and then the questions. So really the opportunities are as I mentioned there's been a pivot in the humanitarian coordination process I think that there's a real recognition of the factors that the built environment play in determining a quality approach and the quality outcome it's, and the impact that we can have. I think that in my mind, and this is just purely an opinion, that this really shows a consolidated 
housing approach and really a more rapid step away from shelter. And this is probably a good thing ultimately as we get better coherence with nexus issues, development outcomes and so forth. Uh, Ella's already mentioned HLP, but I, uh, one, one thing that I'll mention before I finish my, my part is really, um, you know, that in this way, COVID-19 has been a catalyst. It's been a catalyst for making the humanitarian system describe and articulate how it really links to wider issues. So I think that's important. Maybe these issues we can wrap up a bit more in discussion. And I'll hand over to Ella for the final slide. Thank you. Yes, of course, after opportunities, we always have to mention the challenges. And uh, I don't think, I think you're experiencing the challenges uh, yourself in your daily lives. And um, one of them is, uh, again, going to be uh, a major issue is, uh, and it was in the chat uh, being mentioned before, the issue of funding uh, for our sector and the recognition uh, of the shelter to contributing to health uh, outcomes. Because if uh, it's easier to, um, um, to uh, ask for funding and resources for shelter when the, the buildings are, are destroyed and people uh, could see the damage to the uh, living environment, but it's quite difficult maybe uh, for people to see that immediately. So there's a lot of work for us uh, to do um, uh, to overcome uh, this challenge in our, uh, in our sector. Um, and of course, people uh, can also, uh, like I said, uh, uh, they can be seen as expensive or socially or politically contentious, the issue of shielding. Again, in the chat box, I saw a lot of uh, discussions there and maybe not even feasible if we look at the very dense informal set, uh, settlements uh, to do some uh, very serious improvement uh, work there. Uh, so, and then of course, there was a the question of whether we will see a new humanitarian caseload with uh, uh, so many uh, millions of people expected to be out of uh, a job uh, and really uh, uh, so, um, struggle with uh, uh, hunger and food security and uh, job security. So I think we'll finish there. We have come up with uh, a couple of uh, discussion questions on the last slide, if uh, we could go to that uh, tone. But of course, uh, we uh, can also discuss maybe um, other topics uh, of interest. So we have come up with the two questions of how do we bet better articulate the role of shelter to policy and decision makers, uh, the million dollar question. And uh, the other one is maybe are we overstating the role of shelter in a global health response uh, and what could be the practical and ethical implications. So maybe again we're looking too much uh, from our own lens thinking that uh, uh, we're, we should be at the center of the discussion and maybe that's not the case. So that's uh, that's it from our side, and uh, now the work is uh, the rest of the group to have the discussion. Okay, thank you very much, Ella and Brett. That's a very good framing of things. Um, I hang on. I will put those. I've closed the presentation, but I'll leave those questions up. Um, the way we're going to do this, and this is the more experimental bit, so of the afternoon to do be patient with us if it doesn't work very well but we'll do our best um is if you have questions or comments to make please put them put a say so in the chat uh with a little summary of what you want to say and uh laura and i are keeping an eye on the chat and we will pick out things rather than trying to get people to put their hands up because there are so many people on the call we don't think we'll be able to keep track of who has their hands up um so if you have uh, and please do include either, say, if you have a comment on the questions that have been raised at the end of this presentation or a, a related question to one of the previous speakers, um, do let us know um, and we'll, we'll go with that. Um, I'm not seeing anything come up yet, so I'm assuming you're all thinking hard about it. Um, I am going to uh, put, use, because I'm, starting this off i'm going to ask a question of anna noonan if that's okay uh, and um just related to the, the discussion points here because i noticed that in the habitat for humanity international um strategy there was a statement saying that housing is the first line of defense against transmission and i think there'll be lots of discussion in the the chat here as well 
Anna, could you give a bit of an overview of why Contact for Humanity have, have, have that position that housing is the first line of defense against transmission? Yeah, I can, um, I can try. I also invite any of my colleagues um, to jump in as well. Um, I'm pulling up some documentation. Um, and I think we, uh, as a housing centered organization, really kind of jumped in hard as the UN Special Rapporteur uh, Leilani Farah said, that on the right to adequate housing stated that housing has become the frontline defense against the coronavirus. Um, home has rarely been more of a life or death situation. Um, and as a global organization, um, we are often trying to balance kind of our international work and our US side of work. And I think we found that this was a way in which that could, those two things could be brought together because it's the same case in the US as well that if you don't have if you're being told to stay home and that's the best way you can you know protect yourself and protect others but you don't have an adequate safe stable place to call home um, that's an issue and so we have used that as a way in which to frame our work um, I think too right now in all honesty it's been it's a it's a challenge right now because a lot of the interventions that we're seeing are, you know, more wash and health focused. And we really want to make sure that all of our program offerings are done within that core mandate of shelter and settlements. And so we have um, used that, I think, as a way in which to guide that work. Does that help answer a bit? Yes, I think that's very helpful. Um, Laura, do we have? Have you got a, a um, so there's a, a there's a few things coming in on the chat. I think perhaps rather than me just reading things out as as everyone can read what's written there, I might just call on yes, do just uh, call on them. And yeah. They can articulate their points far better than me. Perhaps. So I might start by going to Chloe Loader, who who has a point also about um, about sort of wider living environments in relation to shelter. Uh, Chloe, if you're there, do you want to? Um, after the discussion. Uh, hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, um, it's something that I've sort of been discussing with people a little bit recently anyway, but whether shelter might then start to relate a little bit more broadly um, rather than a response to something specific um, and whether it relates specifically to informal settlements um, generally across uh, any kind of situational setting um, and how that impacts people when they're living in poor living conditions like we were just talking about um, and have no access. So you can't possibly socially distance or so, uh, self-isolate or anything like that. Do you think shelter could then start to address that more generally now? Is that question aimed at someone in particular? Um, or a general question. Really if anyone has anything uh, mm -hmm. to add to it, I think just the last few slides particularly have, have uh, prompted me to think about it a bit more. Um, while people are thinking about that, um, I, Brett has said he wants to comment on the shielding issue. So um, as we were talking about, as it seems related, can Brett, do you want to have a make a comment? Thanks, Tom. I just saw that there was a lot of chatter going back and forward there on, on shielding. And there was one thing that I wanted to mention on that. I mean, certainly it's been discussed kind of in the, the interagency coordination. Many, many people have been involved in that already. Um, WHO have made it clear they don't endorse it as an approach. And on the 1st of May, we had a tri-cluster webinar between CCCM, Shelter and Protection, kind of discussing it couple of hundred people online and what will be some of the approaches or considerations. Now, of course, improving shelter and settlement to give people more, more space, adequate living conditions and try and deal with the poverty conditions of shelter in many countries, that's an important thing, but that's not the same as shielding. Shielding is the, you know, deliberate um, separation of people at high risk 
to prevent them from being exposed. And as I can see, Joseph and others have put in the chat box, which is very true. You know, yep. we find that at least 50% of the people that have died so far globally have been in the elderly and often in the retirement homes and so forth. 90% of the people that have died are in urban areas. B being in an urban area is a particular risk and vulnerability for COVID-19. Um, and very, very interesting. Yesterday, it was actually last night, I heard on a news broadcast that uh, Michelle Bachelard, the head of OHCHR, she was asked a question whether um, the, the deaths of people in um, old people's homes, retirement homes, is a human rights violation, and she suggested that it was. So we would need to be very careful if this is a position that we would promote or any agency would promote, if in the end it did lead to the um, cohorting and unnecessary deaths of people, which is what has happened in developed countries. That's the reason why WHO are not endorsing it as a acceptable approach. So that's just some comment from my side. Certainly not definitive or conclusive. There's lots of other ways of seeing it, but food for thought. Thank you. Tom, can I can I make a comment? Go ahead, Jamie. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting and it's it's something that we've been kind of debating hard on and having these kind of nursing home effect kind of uh, you know ethical moral dis, you know discussions about it and I think from our you know from where we were looking at it in terms of you know where we would as an NGO and our partners be working um, would not be at that that kind of um, neighborhood level which we would think of being like the nursing home kind of situation or or the sector level which would be a separating an area of a camp that we we just wouldn't really be involved at that level but what we are seeing emerging is and we're getting requests from is from communities or from countries where they're saying that this is what communities are doing themselves at household level and i can see that you know let's say at the uk we are doing the same my 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 elderly uh, father-in-law is doing exactly the same right now um, as that you know one of the only strategies they can have to 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 kind of protect themselves so do we have to the question i'd have is you know do you know who is saying shielding is not working but maybe should we should we break that down a little bit so that we um, can look at the realities around that um, and is shielding at household level an acceptable uh, way to 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 support households that are, you know where people are seriously at risk uh, a question. Yeah, that that's interesting, and I I think there's interesting discussion in the chat as well, which seems to be veering towards whether actually we're. You know, well, I think it's the same old old thing about shelter versus housing, and and where does emergency? How do we separate the emergency intervention from the the developmental? And long-term poverty problems, um, and Seki's point here about us looking at using the COVID moment to further make the case for in, in adequate housing. Could you put a bit more, Seki? Could you say a bit more about what you mean about that? Hey, yeah, um, hey, yeah, no, um, I mean, like we we we've been kind of like pondering around how we could of course I contribute to this 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 um, this um, crisis and as as the kind of like limelight is on the response at this moment but then the un underlying issue to try to prevent some things is of course like about density etc and if that is yeah possible and we saw a few examples today from the NACR it does take a lot of time right it takes so much capital away from it and really, I, I think yesterday the conversation from the health conference came about to say, like, yes, it's this underinvestment in the housing sector, and it's all over the world. It's not sexy. It's it's that underlying condition of of the um, informal settlements or the poorer housing, and maybe we as humanitarians kind of linking this crisis humanitarian or emergency crisis to that longer term um need it's maybe it's that moment that we have to kind of really bridge and 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 take on and kind of commit to that right and that we're not in this 
pocket, but we 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 want to connect that more consciously. Can I add something, Tom? Is that okay? Um, sorry, Seki, had you finished? Because I'm, I, it was breaking up. Yeah, I think Seki. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So yes, go ahead, Amelia. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I think what's really interesting when we're discussing this in care is like, you know, is the moment for shelter now? Is it appropriate? Um, should we, are we drawing away from, you know, if we, if we sort of overemphasize or, or emphasize the importance of shelter now, is there, um, you know, have we, uh, you know, as Ella was saying, is we, are we just looking at it from our perspective at the importance of our sector? Um, but, you know, maybe, I think it will come, you know, it's not, perhaps it's not immediately now. And I think the decision we made at CARE was any ongoing um, shelter projects that we're doing now, things that we're involved in now, obviously we're going to adapt and, and look at um, ways to make those a bit safer and more aware of the issues of COVID and transmission. But it's not as though we're going to be promoting new projects as a way to um, you know to fight COVID um, but I think obviously the importance of shelter and the importance of people having a safe space to isolate or the importance of having um, an adequate shelter in which they can clean and they can keep um, um, keep services hygienic and that they've got access to um, wash facilities as part of their home as well is really really important and I think the importance of that is being highlighted as we're going on and perhaps we'll see like a delayed response where, where people um, see the importance of shelter but you know not quite immediately it's going to it's going to come slowly <laughs> there's like slow realization coming coming up thank you um, finish thank you um, <laughs> Ella, you just building on that, you said in the chat, as we can see, a pandemic is not only humanitarian. Could you give a bit more background to your to what you think that means? Oh yes, for, that for was what actually, we do. <laughs> that was a response to something that Hilvi was saying that uh, because we um, I had mentioned something uh, or how um, if we could uh, help with the rental uh, programs, how it could help with the. Uh, livelihoods uh, as well, because there are a lot of people who uh, sometimes pay up to 50% of uh, their income for rent and then uh, we were discussing whether um, that would be housing or shelter uh, and then it wouldn't, wasn't applicable to humanitarian context. That's I think also one of the things that I was trying to highlight uh, while I was uh, talking that we might be looking at a slightly um, um, expanded maybe a scope of humanitarianism here because I think a pandemic is it's happening to everyone so it's happening in humanitarian context but it's also happening in other contexts so we can't if we want to be relevant uh, in a pandemic situation as a sector and if we're also seeking maybe um, uh, ways to uh, show how shelter turns into housing and how settlements turn into communities we might be looking at uh, ways of uh, supporting people who are um, maybe not our traditional um, caseloads and clients, but uh, they might become vulnerable in this situation uh, um, due to uh, due to the results of the pandemic. So that that's uh, what that um, comment was about. And then there is a whole lot of uh, comments on the side, like uh, how some of the rental uh, schemes that are being announced by governments do not uh, support informal uh, settlements uh, or maybe people who are invisible to the government schemes for whatever reason, for protection reasons or uh, for because they're migrants or illegal, uh, not illegal, sorry, informal uh, and all that. So maybe that could be the window uh, for us to bridge uh, that gap and, uh, you know, also uh, uh, remain relevant. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to change what I said at the beginning and actually say to people, if you do want to speak, do use the Zoom function and raise your hand or write, I want to speak or hand or something in the chat because uh, it's actually very difficult for us to keep track of who wants to speak and who's just converse, conversing in the chat box. Um, so 
is there someone who wants to follow up or raise another question? Otherwise, I will call on someone. So, so Bill has just written in the chat that he'd like to make a comment. So, oh, Bill. Go on then, Bill. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to make a comment on, on this, specifically on that second statement or second discussion point about are we overstating the role? Um, so I think um, that we definitely are not overstating the role of shelter in the matter of global health. Um, where I would sort of question it a little bit is are we overstating the role of shelter in in the COVID-19 response and making a very dis big distinction between those two. Um, I think the thing about COVID-19 is that well for us it's an you know unprecedented threat. For most of the people that we work with it's a compounding threat. It's a threat on top of lots of other health risks. Many of them that frankly um, you know will huge threats for people have or have done in the past and will do in the future. So I think the, the, the sort of spotlight that this issue shines on shelter is a huge opportunity for us to absolutely state the role of shelter in the question of global health. But, and this is a question more than a statement really, should we be careful about overstating our role of shelter in the particular response of COVID right now? Thank you. Any follow-ups? There are several people who've written things in the chats. Oh, Brett's raised his hand. Uh, go ahead, Brett. Thanks, Laura and Tom. Um, Bill, that's a good question, and are we overstating things? On the one hand, you know, as everyone's been discussing, we do have this kind of, um, you know, years and decades long underinvestment in quality shelter, quality housing, that's uh, indisputable. On the other, I mean, in our developed country context where most of us are calling in from today, one of the key measures that our governments have put in place is stay at home, wash your hands and keep away from other people. Now, if you're living in a refugee camp or displaced, that's not a luxury that you have. There, because of the lack of quality housing and shelter, you're, you, you need to venture outside to, to access services. You need to go outside several times a day to get water to drink, to go to the toilet, to wash your hands, to buy food. Most places don't have electricity, so you can't stock up your refrigerator for one week and not have to go outside. So the messages that we've been told um, and that we've had to follow aren't, aren't feasible for uh, people living in a, in a camp in Somalia or, or many other countries. So I think that in that sense, the role of shelter is really, really important, but that even if it is improved, it isn't that alone that'll get us the wins that we need because the quality of shelter won't be elevated to the, to the level that we enjoy in most cases. That's a long-term development approach, and I don't see us easily getting there because shelter and housing is something that's really been, or well, housing is being given to the private sector. It's a vehicle for investment, and it isn't something that is part of a public service like education or like health. So the provision of adequate shelter will rely on it being reorientated away from investment processes and um, by getting government to step up and provide better quality public housing programs for, for those that it can. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, one additional thing, can people introduce themselves before they speak? Because um, although I'm sure lots of people don't know lots of other people on this call. Um, uh, there's a, an interesting comment from Emma Matthews. Would you like to expand on on what you made on your comment about not just physical construction but using the pandemic to give voice, knowledge, and skills? 
Hi, um, so my internet's a bit dodgy, so hopefully it'll be fine. But I'm a master student from UCL. Um, so it was just to say that, I, yeah, I think with the pandemic, it is a time that it could be utilised um, and working with communities. I mean, I know it's hard because you can't get on the ground, but with the connections we already have, I think giving the communities the knowledge at this time of what their rights are could be a real catalyst for change. Um, because governments are listening to people a bit more um, and there is the public attention. So yeah, I just thought that was maybe something that could be interesting. Thank you. And it does sound like there's, there are some interesting things about potential increasing advocacy around the importance of shelter and, and outreach and communication rather than necessarily just physical interventions. Um, Xavier, is that you saying you want to speak? I can't. Um, no, not that. Chat, is that right? Can I? Am I? Yes, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I did not want to speak. I just wanted to put a comment over there. Um, and specifically, while we are facing pandemic crisis, uh, the role of the shelter expert or the shelter community or the cluster um, we, need to, we need to probably keep a close eye on the learning at, at every stage so that we can then prepare for it for the future. But while we are at it, the access and the guidelines, because um, I was working closely with uh, one of the shelter, uh, settlement, informal settlement areas in Karachi, um, um, and the access to those communities um, is very difficult and it's raising more and more problems for the informal um, habitants of uh, informal settlement habitants um, and there are there seems to be no guidelines um, having said that that there's another point that i wanted to make was uh, um, the access to water and uh, wash facilities um, perhaps that has been discussed earlier on as well but while we are using it and with a lesser sensibility on the impact of environment um, so underground water depletion, um, introducing the caustic soda into the environment and having a kind of negative impact. These are kind of uh, points that, you know, we, would, we, should, we should look into. Thank you. Um, Safiye, sorry, go ahead. Yes, so maybe I'm going to... <clears throat> To, 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 to destroy an open door, but on my knowledge and my thinking or feeling, I, 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 nev I, don't, I could not remember any moment in history where everybody on earth at the same moment has an intimate uh, thinking about what is home. Uh, being by PSA, by the health sector, being everybody as in dual, having a home or not a home. Um, so I think in, in terms of, 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 of game changing of piloting points uh, i think it's it's a huge opportunity for advocacy uh, as we say you know people have no home uh, so i think it's about this response but also the future uh, we we have a, a lot of difficulties in the sector i think we discuss that every big cluster meeting say you know how we could better uh, mainstream what is shelter sector what is shelter and settlement sector i mean i never get uh, discussion with my my relatives about ah, it's good to have a garden you know about I mean it, it, I, I think it's in terms of 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 uh, of of moment we live is uh, we have a mo an opportunity to to interrogate the relationship of everybody with uh, with at home safely with uh, with for for those I think mean, I think in terms of of opportunity for advocacy uh, I think we ne it's it's rare that we have this opportunity to develop key messages and, and strategies on communication on mainstreaming what is shelter, shelter is home and so on and so on. But that's all, not, nothing more than that. Well, okay. Thank you. Uh, there are no hands up. Anyone else want to step in before and make a comment or ask a question of anyone before I call on someone again? Um, Michelle uh, Young, I see your comment that this could actually be a long-term uh, situation. Could you give a bit more of your thoughts on that? If you are there. Um, 
I can't find Michelle. Uh, so maybe then we ah, could. There you go. Oh, sorry, oh. go on, Laura. No, I was just going to say Lizzie had um, Lizzie Babster had said a lot further up about you know could we see shelter as p as PPE sort of coining the phrase shelter as PPE and I was wondering if Lizzie if you want to expand on that a little bit. Sure. Um, I mean, this, I should say, I think I said in, in the comments eventually, it's sort of very much in the COVID-19 context. I wasn't talking about um, it more generally or, or maybe not even in the longer term, although it might be a good place to start. Um, but I, I think we've got a good moment to think about, OK, well, what is the role of shelter? And maybe in an answer to the question of are we overstating this, um, perhaps the role of shelter in this particular moment is one of protection. Um, and we could have a look at, you know, how shelter and settlements can be um, a protective measure um, rather than um, how we sometimes see shelter as an asset that has been damaged or destroyed and needs replacing. And it, it might give us that opportunity to talk about things um, on a less transactional basis. Um, so, you know, we often go in and, you know, if you're doing a sort of multi-sector assessment, um, for example, it's like, you know, count the houses that need replacing. Um, this does give you a moment to sort of think about shelter in a very different way, and that could be quite a good opportunity, um, especially when you're talking to sort of policy or decision makers um, who might not necessarily have um, considered the shelter sector um, very much in the past it might sort of offer a, a way in especially if they're more familiar with the terminology around health and that sort of thing um but it you know I, I i think um going back to you know what anna noonan was saying as well this shelter is ppe in this situation if you do not have um formal tenure or if you don't have you know tenure that's going to last very long and you can't plan how you're going to set up how you're going to live it's it has a massive impact on your access to you know other forms of PPE like your um, access to sort of water sources um, and how you actually social distance yourself and how you take care of your mental health if you've got um, if you don't have you know a, a, a pleasant or quiet or um, you know, a place to live where it's not overcrowded. So I think it has a, a massive impact. But having said that, you know, I, I do get this point that we shouldn't be, um, you know, a hammer looking for nails. We, we are the shelter sector, we are not the health sector, and we need to work very closely with those other sectors um, for whom this is a much more obvious um, place to step in. Thank you. That's very carefully considered. I think that's quite a, a good way of viewing it. Um, Helmi, you wanted to say something. Uh, yes, I mean, on the same point, you know, uh, regardless whether we are overstating or this is the golden opportunity to uh, advocate uh, for advocacy, uh, we can sort of generally agree uh, we have an opportunity. Um, the key points may differ based on organizations about evictions to displacements to you know uh, density many other things but i think if we going forward uh, from this meeting if we can a few of us come together and uh, identify maybe a few issues we can all collectively agree i think uh, it would help uh, individually between organizations as well as uh, collectively for our humanitarian shelter and settlements. I don't know if anybody uh, interested, I think we should explore that uh, and see where we can get. Um, yeah, uh, maybe, you know, uh, I can kind of start the connection, but I, I don't need to lead it, but you know, anybody is interested can take on, but uh, I think we have an opportunity to, uh, as an action point going forward. Thank you. That's interesting thoughts as well about what we could be taking for. And I'm sure there would be interest to me and people in, in it being taken forward. Um, any final points? We're getting towards the end of our time, but um, we do have a few more minutes if people, if people want to make any final comments. 
Um, I will I will make a quick comment um, while people are deciding whether they want to say anything else, um, which is that it does seem to me like there are obvious roles for shelter responses, but it's certainly, as Lizzie said, it's, it's certainly not something that, needs, that should be central and it should be playing a supporting thing and that adequate health protective response um but it does seem to me that there really is this this opportunity to uh, perhaps even have a maybe a campaign is the is is the right word but to come together and actually say because this crisis is global and it is bringing existing injustices that are so centered on housing into stark relief um and the risks that people face because of poor housing um are brought into stark relief by this um, as well as their only living gen home and, and abuse that uh, people who are uh, that just goes up and up every time something like this happens. That whether the sector should actually be coming together and saying, look, we don't have the capacity to funding, but governments do, as Brett was saying, and uh, and uh, this is the time to recognise that and to actually see a shift in the importance government place on providing housing um, as a DRR measure and, and improvement for the future. Um, that's kind of my takeaway from this discussion. Um, any other points from anyone? Perhaps Brett or Ella would like to wrap up because um, I think you have a particular challenge for, for the shelter cluster in, in actually coordinating what what it is the global response to this and, and what does everyone do and um, perhaps you could like to give some closing thoughts. Ella would you be willing to? Well I think uh, since we have tackled all the challenges of the shelter sector I think we yeah. can take on the pandemic uh, <laughs> as well. <laughs> But um, yes, I think it's also quite a new um, area for us uh, in terms of uh, the coordination uh, structures, how we, uh, I mean, uh, at least uh, I, if I can speak for myself, uh, we're really learning um, a lot around um, WHO uh, coordination uh, and all that. So this is um, um, still quite new um, ground, uh, I think. But it could also, um, I have to say that I have never seen uh, this much um, willingness and interest between the clusters, for example, to be relevant to each other's work and uh, to coordinate and to, um, uh, to come up with things that, uh, uh, that more than one cluster can, can work on. So I think maybe that's also something that we should uh, try to capitalize on, uh, this uh, increased willingness to do things together and uh, to especially highlight um, uh, the cross-sectoral uh, uh, aspect of our work. So I think that's something that uh, hopefully we will be able to learn from and uh, perform better in the future. Uh, that will be my um, takeaway and hope as we move uh, forward in this uh, situation. Brett, do you have any uh, final um, closing words? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, primarily from the perspective of what you know humanitarian shelter practitioners can do and how the coordination is i mean it's been a real roller coaster in the last couple of months i think all of us in the beginning myself um was thinking oh this is really a health issue health will take the lead don't know if there's much of a role for shelter and that's really moved a lot i see the on the budget table in the global hrp i mean the first version was you know two, two million now it's up to 6.8 6.9 million and you know it's been launched with you know by the head of different UN agencies and it's been done with development agencies as well it's not just the humanitarian actors it's got you know UNDP uh, and there's heavy engagement with regional development banks World Bank are giving a couple of billions so the collaboration on this one is quite interesting and I know that we've been asked to give a lot of feedback to these different donors and actors and comment on their proposals and comment on their reports and different things so in the last two months our interaction with um these development counterparts has been in such a way that we never have in the last three or four years um 
so I think that there's, as, as Ella mentioned, there's been a collaboration, which is really interesting. It's a whole of society approach. I'm not saying that it's going to produce results in the way that we want, or that we'll get a bigger slice of the pie. Um, I think that we've got a fairly big slice as it is. Access is still the big problem though. Um, and and many, many of us, you know, we're confined to base. Even staff in the field are confined to base and they can't go to displacement sites, camps. So I think that the effectiveness of our response, we need to be pretty careful about because we might be promising more than we can deliver until things open up properly. I think that the longer term, I mean, this was soon discussed after the humanitarian response began, the impact on jobs and livelihoods as a result of the economic side of things. One other aspect I think is important for all of us is this kind of rolling wave and this effect that will go on. It won't be this quick up and down. It'll be outbreak and um, secondary and tertiary displacement and issues. I mean, when I mentioned it yesterday, but when we look in April, there was more than 115,000 people um, Afghans that that walked back, came back from Iran, they'll n now end up at least half of them as IDPs in urban areas. Uh, so there's a lot of these under the radar issues that are going on. Our media is unfortunately bombarded by Western um, concerns. Now there's been a depopulation as well. I mean, look at India. As soon as there was a lockdown, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people walking hundreds of kilometres back to their village of origin. Because after a couple of days of no daily wage income, they can't survive in an urban area. So it's been a, a de-urbanisation in some senses as well. The impacts of this are really unpredictable. There's some good quotes online. I won't give them by Arundhati Roy and others that are talking about, you know, the... Um, um, mind changing, system changing opportunities that are coming up. I think we need to seize the day. There, the, the social and political impacts of this won't just be within our national settings, they'll be in, in terms of global structures as well. Um, I think all of us are here because we're passionate about shelter and settlement issues. We believe in it. We believe in the humanitarianism of it and there'll be a lot of options for opening up new collaborations, discussions and political steps forward within our organisations and at the interagency level that we haven't had for years. So although the, the, it's a fairly hectic time, I'm also feeling strangely energised and positive about it at the same time. So um, I might just end on that point, but thanks very much to Care and Tom and the facilitators and everyone who's prepared. It's, it's really great, great to see everyone online. I hope you're all keeping safe. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Brett and, and Ella. And to all the people who presented um, and to everyone who's contributed, it's been really good having being able to have some kind of shelter forum. And I think it's it's gone pretty well. Um, so I think we've got some thinking to do as the shelter forum committee as well. What the shelter look like? There may be some change there, especially looking at the chat box and decolonizing the shelter forum. Um, so Thank you very much everyone for joining and it was brilliant to talk to you all and uh, we will hopefully if we can manage the size of the file post this online so people can see it and uh, um, see you next time whenever that is. Thanks everyone. Thanks Tom. Thank you. Bye bye. Tom, bye, -bye. bye everyone. Bye.